Hey there, I'm Jenny Thomas. I'm with PNG Beauty and have been for the last 18 years or so. Started not long after finishing my PhD in analytical chemistry, never imagining that I would be spending nearly two decades studying hair and scalp. But I have to say, I find it fascinating. There's still so much to learn, and I think I'm in it for the long haul. So now my role is a leader of our global hair and scalp science communications team. And speaking of scalp, that is the topic I want to talk much more about today. So let's get into this overview of scalp care. Starting with, there's a lot of interest in it. And there has always been for a long time. And of course, that grew with the pandemic. Makes a lot of sense when there was so much talk about cell care and trying out new routines while having more time at home. But even as we've moved back to more typical daily lives, that interest has only continued to grow. Um, and there's quite a lot of talk about treating your scalp like skin, which is an interesting conversation to have because it makes a lot of sense, but there are some caveats. So let's talk about that comparison. How does your scalp skin compare to your body skin? Well, they share the same physiology, um, but they do have a very distinguishing feature that sets them apart. And that's the environment in which they're immediately surrounded. So for those of us who have a head full of hair, the scalp skin is covered by terminal hairs, which create this very unique, dark, warm, moist environment. It's quite different from the environment around like body skin that is covered by the veilous hairs. They're much more sparse. They're thinner. They're shorter. They leave that body skin far more exposed to the elements. And it's this unique environment that creates needs that are quite unique to the scalp relative to the rest of your body. Now, we think about the scalp um, condition is falling along this spectrum from symptomatic, as in demonstrating symptoms that people generally aren't happy about, happy about, to asymptomatic symptom relief, but still opportunity to get to optimal condition. So we'll talk about that spectrum um, and some considerations along the way. But it's helpful to to go back to. Um, and we'll start with the symptomatic scalp, really with a focus on dandruff. And the reason why I want to focus mostly on dandruff is because it's the most prevalent scalp issue. Um, about 50% of the adult population experiences it in some form or another. And compare that to something like psoriasis, where maybe 3% of the population experiences it. Of course, that's a concern. That and some other more severe scalp issues. Um, lower incidence and worse talking to your dermatologist or your physician about it. But in the case of dandruff, this is something that you can manage with your normal routine. And again, extremely prevalent. It spans genders, ethnicities, um, wide age range too. It generally starts around puberty and then it drops off around menopause for women or can span a few more decades even for, for men. So um, number of decades where the dandruff condition is is very normal and common. Now, when you hear the word dandruff, you're likely imagining flakes, and I realize that the pictures I have on the screen are <laughs> are prompting that too. Um, but you can have dandruff without having flakes. It can man manifest itself as an itchy scalp, dry scalp, tight or irritated scalp, and of course a flaky scalp. It can also be any combination of those symptoms. And it's rooted in accelerated scalp skin cell turnover. So what should be a 28-day process where skin cells fluff off one by one, like one by one, they're invisible as they slough off, but that speeds up tremendously to a five to 21-day process. And the faster you go, the more errors that can happen. It's kind of like my typing. Um, that, you know, if it's sped up really fast, instead of sloughing off one by one, those cells might clump together and slough off as a more, a larger and then therefore more visible flake or have disruptions in the barrier that you feel is itch or you feel is dryness. Um, 
Now, to give you an idea of how common this is, here's some data from a survey asking 1,800 men and women in the U.S. You know, what concerns you, if anything, about your scalp? Only 27% of them said none of these symptoms are you know, something that they're concerned about. Um, the rest of the rest of them are spread across the range of symptoms. So it gives you a, an idea of the breadth and the variability that can happen in that dandruff experience. Um, but perhaps you're wondering, why is it that the scalp skin cells are turning over so fast? What's causing that to happen? So there are ultimately three factors that come together to trigger this. And um, the acceleration and then therefore the disrupted scalp skin barrier. So those three factors are an imbalance of the scalp microbiome. So we all have the scalp microbiome, and it's particularly a species called Malassezia globosa that's in it, that there's an, a, an overgrowth that happens. And everybody has this. They're, the scalp oils, they're a factor too. We all have that. And then the third factor is the one that determines whether or not you fall into the 50% that experiences dandruff or the 50% that it's not dandruff prone. And that's just how susceptible are you? How reactive is your skin to the environment that's um, ar right around your scalp? So let's go a little bit deeper into all of this because understanding this model makes it very intuitive what care choices make sense versus which one may not be the right ones to go after. Okay, so here's what's happening on your scalp. So microbiomes, we have them all over our skin. And again, that dark, warm, moist environment on our scalp creates a unique environment. And the microbiome on the scalp is rather unique. So Malassezia globosa is one that especially loves that dark, warm, moist scalp environment. It thrives there. And it absolutely loves scalp oils. It could eat them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Goes after those triglycerides, breaks them down into lipid byproducts, um, some of which are reactive oxygen species. And while that colony is proliferating and flourishing, the waste that it's leaving behind on your scalp is starting to interact with the scalp skin. And for half the population, that triggers an inflammatory reaction, which then leads to the barrier disruption and ultimately those symptoms that we talked about. For the other half, doesn't bother them. They're not even aware it's going on. No harm, no foul, right? Um, okay, so that's what's going on in the environment. Now the question is, what do you do about it? If you're looking for options out there, um, searching for scalp care, you're going to find a wide range of suggestions, a lot of which have something to offer. Um, okay, so when it comes to this Back to this three-factor model, um, there are certain care approaches that you can take to address each of them, and we'll we'll go through them one by one. The first one is about addressing the imbalance of the microbiome to get back to a better scalp-friendlier um, balance. And there are a lot of ingredients that are out there on the market that can address the Malassezia globosa that's the one um, whose overgrowth is of concern and has been linked to the scalp skin disruption that can happen with dandruff. So this is a, a range of um, most of the available anti-dandruff active ingredients that are out there. It does depend on where you are in the world as to what's available. Um, it's also from a product making point of view, it's important to consider what's effective and what's the cosmetic profile of, of the ingredient that you're going to go with. Because it's only effective if people are willing to use it and willing to continue using it. There is no cure for dandruff. So it's it's something that you just need to um, work into your routine to keep it under control. Okay, so let's take a few for example. Selenium sulfide highly effective when it comes to working against the Malassezia globosa. I mean, highly effective, proven in many, many cl clinical studies. Um, but the cosmetic properties are not ideal, um, and it can leave some people feeling like they're 
trading off using a shampoo that they love for something that they need to use. And that's because selenium sulfide naturally has a color and an odor that comes along with it. So that's a consideration for that ingredient, which is different from ingredients like zinc pyrithione and peroctone olamine. These are, I believe, two of the most widely used anti-dandruff ingredients. And again, it depends on where you are in the world as to what's available. But um, neither of them have a color that needs to be masked or an odor that needs to be masked. And they can just be added into you know, great shampoos that clean and that condition your hair and then now have this third element um, to care for your scalp. Salicylic acid, that's another one that's quite common. Um, you see that it's red against mal malassezia. That's because that's not the mechanism through which it works. It's known to work through more of an exfoliating mechanism um, as a keratolytic. It is believed to break up the clumps of skin cells that would form the flakes. And so you remove those flakes as you wash. So it's working more in a dandruff symptom than it is on the um, fundamental factors. Speaking of factors, the next one to talk about is scalp oils and what can you do to remove the excess and reduce those reactive oxi oxygen species that can be generated from them. Um, I'm going to guess this comes as no surprise, but the best way to manage that is to wash your scalp. Um, but how often is a question we often hear. Also, we, we find that there are a number of people who, once they notice scalp issues flaring up, will say, Oh, I think I need to wash less often because um, I'm afraid that washing is just going to exacerbate my scalp problems. But treatment and epidemiological studies would say the opposite is true. Um, the more often that people wash their scalp in these studies, the better their scalp condition, either from an expert grader point of view as the data on the left side, looking at what's the flaking score of somebody um, using treatment based on wash frequency, or on the right side is an epidemiological study self-assessment here around some of these key symptoms linked to wash frequency. Um, and in both cases, we see that those with a higher wash frequency have a lower tendency to have these um, the scalp issues. But also recognize that washing more often is easier said than done for some people. Um, it may not suit your hair type. It may not suit your schedule. So in that case, you'll want to rely more heavily on treating your scalp with leave-on treatments that have those anti-dandruff um, active ingredients that can help get that scalp microbiome balance back in a, a better place. So that would be the approach that you would want to take um, if reducing the excess sebum is not something you're able to do as regularly. Okay, so then there's the third factor. And in this case, it is the individual susceptibility that you can't change whether your skin reacts to the lipid byproducts of the feeding process, um, at least not that we know of yet. And so that's why the most abundant scalp care options um, are focused on correcting imbalances in the microbiome or removing excess sebum. In fact, most of them are in shampoo form because you can effectively do both and easily fit into a routine that people already have. Um, but from the product making point of view, it's important that we approach it as in the do no harm approach, because we need to be sure that we're creating formulas that are going to be compatible for a scalp that's in an irritated state, because the last thing you want to do is um, make it more prone to react. So that's where formulation chemistry comes into play. And there's quite a lot of fascinating chemistry that goes into these because a number of things need to happen. So first, of course, is my cell chemistry, the idea being that we want to use these cleansing surfactants that are important to removing the excess sebum, but have them only work on the surface, not penetrate into the skin and interact with the skin structure where they could disrupt other lipids or just um, prevent the scalp from getting back into its healthy state. So in this case, using co-surfactants to pair up with, ingred with surfactant ingredients, using micelles to keep all of that cleansing action on the surface allows you to effectively remove the excess oil without 
um, perturbing the skin structure. Now, if you've looked at um, ingredient lists for scalp care shampoos, you are likely to find that it uses sulfated surfactants. And so some people, I mean, the vast majority of them do. And some people look at it and think, oh, I can't, I don't think I can use that, or I don't think that's going to be the right thing for my scalp. But um, there is a scientific reason why this is the case. Um, in addition to cleansing and conditioning, like all shampoos do, scalp care shampoos have a third job. They also have to bring scalp care ingredients to the scalp. Um, so again, these opposite direction mechanisms. And the molecular structure within the formula is more complex than just forming micelles. The micelles then become part of this larger network with polymers and entrapping these scalp actives. It's all part of what's called a coacervate system to enable this seemingly opposing action to happen. Um, yeah, so the micelles make up part of the system and these sulfate containing micelles work really, really well with the coacervate chemistry. It's really been a, where it's been most developed. It's a lot more challenging to effectively deliver those ingredients with alternative surfactants. So that's why there is a technical reason for going with sulfated surfactants in these products. And then on top of that, there's clinical proof to say it works. It works to improve the scalp health via, here's some data from a head and shoulders clinical study of it's effective in reducing flakes. It's effective in reducing itch. Oh, and by the way, it's also infect effective in improving the function of that scalp skin barrier um, because it's working against those against those um, factors while also being very compatible with the scalp. Okay, Woo. that's a lot on the symptomatic scalp. Let's shift over then to... Um, asymptomatic scalp, because it really has been the norm to consider symptom relief as success, right? Um, but there's new data now that we understand a bit more. There really is a difference between getting to an asymptomatic scalp and continuing to work towards an optimal scalp and their benefits to continuing on. Okay, so it also depends on your starting point, because if you're dandruff prone, the benefits are about preventing that resurgence or having better control over the dandruff condition. Now, I'm showing you data from a very recent clinical study that we did with head and shoulders, where it was an opposite approach to what we normally take. Normally, you start with people who have, you know, their dandruff is, is full on and you give them a treatment, you give them a placebo so that then we can measure what impact does that treatment have on their dandruff condition as they continue to use it over a period of time? Well, in this case, we did the opposite. We had them start with their dandruff under good control, regular use of, in this case, it was head and shoulders, and then had them stop and switch to um, a cosmetic shampoo, so no scalp care active included, and then measured what was happening to their scalp skin in response. So as people switch, they think they've got it under control, switch to something else, very common behavior. How is their skin responding? Now, what we saw was that within three days of not using the anti-dandruff treatment, we could already measure the return of itch biomarkers, um, biomarkers indicating scalp barrier disruption and the return of oxidative stress were already significantly increasing. So the takeaway here was once you have your symptomatic scalp under control, it's when you want to shift into maintenance mode and keep going because this is what's going to give you um, control over a dandruff resurgence happening because remember, there is no cure. So it is about just regular treatment. Okay, but what if you're not dandruff prone? Um, is there any reason to, is there any benefit for you to caring for your scalp? It's like we're taking the individual susceptibility factor out of this model, but you do still have the scalp microbiome that can become overgrown. You do still have scalp oils that are building up on your scalp. Um, and the 
creation then of these reactive oxygen species that can happen is the malassezia feeds on the scalp oils. So your scalp is still under an increasing level of oxidative stress. Now, there was a another clinical study that was done. And in this case, it was a population of people, 300 people, who did not, they weren't dandruff prone. They didn't have a dandruff condition. Um, and it was having them use treatments, a couple of different treatments, and they included some of the um, anti dandruff actives that we talked about earlier, some with CPT and proctonolamine, some with proctonolamine, to see is there any benefit that it can offer for their um, for their scalp? And in fact, we saw, yes, those who used the treatment had less oxidative stress, which then translated to improved scalp skin barrier um, through the biomarker of albumin, we saw that as well as looking at transepidermal water loss, the function improved with treatment. But you could wonder, um, does it does it matter if my scalp's not bothering me? Does it does it really matter? Well, it does to your hair. So scalp and hair condition, they're inextricably linked. The pre-emergent hair is going to spend about two weeks inside the follicle, so just below the scalp surface traveling up that four millimeter journey before it emerges to face the world. Um, and so that whole time, if your scalp is under oxidative stress, that oxidative stress can be transmitted to the pre-emergent hair, which can show up as signs of surface roughness and cuticle irregularities. So by reducing oxidative stress at the scalp surface can also reduce oxidative stress to that newly emerging hair. And then another benefit that we found um, by reducing the oxidative stress around your scalp is strengthening hair's anchor to the scalp. So the same clinical study has shown that a scalp under oxidative stress is prone to shed hairs early and excessively. But with effective scalp care and reducing that oxidative stress, um, you can effectively reduce the amount of hairs that are being shed. So. Yes, there are benefits to caring for your scalp, even if you're starting in an asymptomatic place. Okay, so we've covered that spectrum now. Um, let's let's talk a few just practical tips. So, true or false? Going to bed with a wet head has a negative impact on scalp condition. Give you a moment to think about it. The answer is true. Remember, we talked. Malassezia loves that dark warm, moist environment. And when you have a wet head, it's even more warm and uh, just malassezia's dream place. So it is happy proliferating and creating that lipid waste all over your scalp while you sleep. So highly recommend if you are a night washer and an air dryer, allow enough time for your hair to dry before you go to bed or just dry your scalp with a quick blow dry um, if that suits you. Okay, next one. Using natural oils on your scalp is good for scalp health. Common advice that you might find if you're searching for solutions online. Um, it's false, though. Even though it sounds so soothing, especially if you find oils for your skin or your face to be, you know, really good for your, for whatever issue you're addressing, remember the environment on your scalp is different. Um, and you going back to those three factors, you're increasing the oils on which the malassezia is going to feed, fueling that dandruff cycle. So what works on other parts of your body does not always translate to good scalp care. Um, but we talked about it's increasing those scalp oils. And actually, this is some um, showing um, malassezia growth in a petri dish of the natural oils can really fuel that as it feeds on them. So again, not recommended. Um, now, scalp scrubs, massages, those are quite common as well. Uh, true or false, are they a beneficial thing to do? All signs point to true. As, as long as it's not too extreme, though. You don't want to be just scratching or too harsh because that could damage your skin, your scalp skin, it can also damage the hair. So don't use your fingernails. Use soft surfaces like the nubs on this massager. 
the tips of your fingertips, um, but that increased blood circulation is good for helping that um, high energy process of fueling that newly growing hair. So massage away. If in, if nothing else, it can help to relieve stress. And who doesn't want that? All right. So in summary, um, if I can leave you with three tips, it is one, yes, take good care of your scalp. Your scalp skin and your hair will thank you. Two is opt for clinically proven solutions because there's a lot of stuff out there, but not everything is proven to work. And some things can even make the problem worse. So you really want to go for those that you um, that there's some proof that it, it's going to be effective at working well with your scalp. And then the third is frequency matters here. Your scalp's under oxidative stress on a daily basis from that immediate environment, but also could be from UV exposure. So our scalps need regular care too to remain um, in good condition. All right. Well, that is it. Um, I did put a number of reference references that were on the slides. They were in tiny text. So in case you would like to read up a bit more on some of those studies that were mentioned, here's a list of references and there, there are plenty more. But I hope from today that you've enjoyed it, maybe taken away something new, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you.